Hello from Go to Chicago. Uh, fortunate today to be uh, here with uh, Fred George and Dan North, uh, two uh, agile and software di disruptors, and uh, we're just going to have a chat to them about. Uh, Given all uh, the things he could have said about us, yeah. that was pretty kind. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll disavow that. Uh, so I'm going to just chat with them a bit about, uh, you know, what the way that you know sort of the best teams are building software today are the best teams that they encounter, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that's there's just to sort of classify it. There's those people who have the complete degrees of freedom that maybe. Uh, uh, Fred's able to work with, and Dan, I know, has worked with them too in, 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 in several companies. But there's also, uh, you know, great teams that are working in a, in a much more constrained environment. So, mm -hmm. so uh, programmer anarchy, you seem to have infected yet another company with it, Fred. Yeah, although, of course, anarchy is not exactly the best term to use in front of CEOs. Uh, yes. But it's kind of like extreme programming back in the day it was not the best term to sort of sell Agile. Um, yeah, so you know, we basically have decided that as we put the team together, we make sure that we basically build in a lot of things like the trust and, and the empowerment of the programmers. And we're, we're basically hiring people that are very experienced, and so our, our charter basically is to stay out of their way. Let's, let's turn them loose with the real problems and uh, let them innovate. So, have you, what's your uh, thoughts on this uh, programmer anarchy? Um, well, a couple of things. One is I've seen this style of development work with not just our experienced developers, but also with uh, shiny graduates coming into that environment. And that really surprised me. And I, I realized that it was probably because they hadn't learned a bunch of bad habits that they needed to unlearn. Like they just kind of, they come in fresh from college and they look at this and they go, well, it's not what we learned at college, but this must be how work works. And then, you know, spools them for any other kind of work. You know, they go into some other environment and they're like, what are you doing? Surely this can't work. The, uh, I take issue with the word anarchy. I really do. Um, and the reason, I think Fred will probably agree with me, the reason is, so anarchy is an absence of rules, an absence of, of, of any of that stuff, and, and, a, and an assumption that it will just kind of work itself out. The, there's a very strong kind of tacit assumption and tacit kind of uh, deal, if you like, uh, commitment from anyone engaged in this. They, they, take, they take their stuff seriously. They really do. They have, you see in a lot of these teams in the various companies that Fred's been, I love your infecting, yeah, in the companies that Fred's been infecting and, and various other places, that there are very strong shared values, very strong shared beliefs about what good software looks like, what good product design looks like, so, um, and your phrase like getting out of their way is exactly right. I think there needs to be a, an awful lot of alignment, whether that's tacit or explicit, um, before you can get that model to work. Well, when, I, when you do, it's, it's incredible. Well, I think there's two traits we look for in this environment. I mean, I always look for self-learners, people that are, you know, want to pick this up for themselves, yeah. and also a passion for delivery. And I think those are the two keys that, that allow you to work. Because it's the anarchy, sort of the first definition that we talked yeah. about. It's one where the organization of the team is done from within the team, not from imposed from the outside with some you know, super knowledge. Because mm -hmm. the knowledge doesn't exist any better outside than yeah. the team. We're social animals, unless you happen to be a sociopath. Then, then you basically you do want to organize yourself. You do look for leadership. You look for recognition. Uh, peer pressure is very, very strong for conformance. Uh, you kind of let those forces work themselves out. I had the same experience as well. We, we acquired a company, when my, one of my London companies acquired another company with ordinary programmers. We kind of ripped out the management structure, ripped out some other things, and they were way more productive yeah. uh, and happier and enjoying their jobs better. Um, so I think there was something in there just about trusting, <coughs> trusting them. Even an uh, ordinary programmer doesn't want to come in. I mean, what programmer shows up every day and says, I'm going to write some bugs? The fact that it happens is probably a, a, a failing of our processes and our structure around that. So, uh, so what happens? If we, you know, Fred, you worked at IBM, you know, a large corporation. Many, you know, worked with many large IBM customers. You know, big you know, institutions. Um, well, know, Dave's other, saying this is someone who also yeah, worked yeah, at IBM. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> other, He's like, you worked at IBM. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, <laughs> Well, I, I was mm. in, I was I was in a bubble because I, I, we we brought in a, a protected entity and it was protected for the time I was 
I was with IBM. But the uh, uh, my question is, how you know, what, what do you think the odds are of bringing it in there? Could you know, because that's something you could do into a corporate environment. You know, or is it something that's going to take a kind of uh, new gen kind of company? Uh, well, I, I, th I actually know quite a few two people in IBM still, and a lot of these guys are are doing a lot of the things we're talking about. As long as it's an internal delivery or internal products they're building, uh, those sort of processes run free. I think it's when you go to the external customers and expectations are, are set for project managers and, and many other sure. other roles. And frankly, you make more consulting money the more people you put on the project. So yeah, I want 16 different roles defined. I want to have you know different levels. I want to charge accordingly. And you kind of feed, you know feed the beast and keep it going. Um, so I think that's kind of the flow of, of that you know expect setting the expectations with the customer and, and following through with it. So what are the big barriers to adoption? Well, a lot of it's trust. You know that your customer has to sort of say first of all I'm going to trust that we'll make good decisions on your behalf. Um, and the and the other thing is we've trained the customers over over the years to you know tell us what you want and. and excruciating detail, sign it in blood, promise you don't change your mind, and we promise to deliver. We, we trained them to do that over the years. They used to, we, in the 70s, that's not the way we worked. Um, we trained them that way. Now we have to untrain them. We have to say, trust us. You, know, you don't have to ask for every feature up front, otherwise you don't get it. Just tell us what you need today. Uh, they're not ready to respond that way. Well, and it's also, it's on us to, 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 make, to help them with that. We're, we're the one that's changing the game. You know, we, we're, we're the ones that are saying, do you know what, if we deliver in small increments, and we have a lot of low-touch collaboration with you rather than these big ceremonial things in uh, every period of time, that we think we can deliver a better product with less risk, you know, risk-adjusted our return on capital, all that kind of stuff. And they're looking at us again, you're the same guy that just last year, you know, so, so it's actually, it's on us to kind of help them with that. And we're kind of, you know. But there are also so organizational structures, I mean, project offices. I mean, basically a lot of our processes have been institutionalized into the organization. The easiest guys to transition to this are programmers. Uh, but as you work into the self into other roles, some of these roles don't even make sense anymore. We're talking about people, you know, basically having to reorganize or lose their lose their roles and responsibilities. How do you, how do you deal with the the uh, you know the role of the customer, domain knowledge and that sort of thing? Is that uh, well, it's a, I think it's it's probably the only two interesting roles we have. It's, one is a visionary, uh, and and then one and then it's somebody who's going to make sure the software stays clean at some level, so it's easy to change. I think every, almost everything else is interchangeable. And whether that visionary is coming from a, a software developer that did the previous release, or whether it's a, a customer with a vision what it's to accomplish, you still need that visionary. Uh, and it doesn't have to come with a title necessarily. Just know who this guy to look for is. Uh, so I look for a visionary. If you haven't got one, a lot of times, I'm sure you've done the same thing, we have to play the visionary role. Mm -hmm. We have to be the consolidator of the vision. We have to you know, sell it, go out there and sell it as the thing we want to do. I think also a lot of those formally specialized roles um, certainly the way I coach this is that the, the way they engage changes. So we've traditionally, we look at a specialist and we say, do this specialized thing that you do. As a business analyst, analyze the business. As a tester, test the software. And, and it's shifting now to say, as a business analyst, you carry a capability of analysis. Help us understand what it means to, to understand how this business works. Or as a tester, the last thing I want you doing is testing. I want you raising the capability of testing in everyone in the team. I want you to be an, a, a vector of testing this around the place. And things like product owner, and this is one where um, uh, folks like Jeff Patton get really upset about this because he's both product guy and sure. software guy. Yeah. Um, he's like, why on earth would you have a product owner outside of a software team? That's just crazy. Unless the role of the product owner is to coach the team to make good product decisions. Like, for me, a successful product owner isn't saying, oh, we need to do this and this and this. A successful product owner is largely making themselves redundant because the team can make really good product decisions. I think that, 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 that implies that the, the team is really empowered. I mean, really has a lot of domain knowledge, which, yeah, oh, which, and, and, or, which is or, or, or often willing not the to case. Learn a lot of domain knowledge. Or, or, yeah, or, yeah. or willing, to, willing to learn a lot of domain knowledge. Or you, right? or you bet. I mean, the on-site customer is all about putting the domain knowledge into the team. And I think that's, that's what we're, I've seen that work really well when you bring the domain expertise. And I, and I think it's more than just anything. Anytime you have an expert, whether it's front end expert, database expert, or domain expert, uh, their job is to build competence in the rest of the team. Not expertise, because yeah. that's a long, long right. haul, but at least build competence. 
and knowing that here's the edge of my knowledge, I need to go find the expert. And I think the more we build these sort of poly-skilled workers who are competent in, in these rest of technologies, they can take a problem and solve it. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, I was working at a trading firm, and the two of the first four people in, so as developers that came in, um, were ex-Googlers. Uh, no trading background. One of them had never seen trading, any trading environment, any finance environment in his life. Um, uh, they had been doing things like uh, paint apps on the iPhone, right? Very, very talented programmers, just that's what they had been doing. And so the first thing that they did was sat with traders. They sat with traders, they learned trading, they absorbed trading, they went off and studied it, and then, you know, before they're writing any software, and one of those guys is now leading the dev team for a uh, very successful trading desk and he's, a, he's, a, he's got a phenomenally deep trading knowledge. He decided that the way to be effective in this environment is I've got to go learn trading yeah, and, and, and that was a choice. And, but again, it's the, it's the mutual support thing. So within the team, there was the trust. You as a programmer want to learn trading. I as a trader will spend the time to sit with you and, and, and teach you this stuff. And it was, that paid off so much, so many times over. And I think a lot of this has been exacerbated by our business need to go faster. I mean, we talk about how fast we're going, you know, 30 years ago and then 20 years ago and 10 years ago. I think the speed at which we're running is driving us to try to create these poly-skilled workers. The specialist works fine in nine-month delivery cycles, but it doesn't work in two-day cycles. Yeah. Although sometimes a specialist is needed. In, in, I love in, the expertise. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. love the expertise. Yeah. And, and you want to have those guys around and call on them. Well, thank you very much, Dan and Fred. This thank was really you. good. And, uh, for those who thought XP was scary, yeah, maybe you'll be thinking about uh, uh, complete programmer anarchy. Uh, although, as I think as Dan uh, sussed it out, there's really a, a lot of trust and discipline uh, in the this. The most in, disciplined in, anarchist I've ever seen. So, so, <laughs> so I, guess, I guess it's perhaps the, the anarchists are all, all have the same cause. There you so go. you get alignment there. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you.